Sounds. When Peter Curtin will walk down the long corridor to the guillotine room, flanked by his priest, a guard, and a psychiatrist. He asks his psychiatrist, tell me, after my head is chopped off, will I be able to hear, at least for a moment, the sound of my own blood gushing from the stump of my neck? The psychiatrist, startled by the question, said that he was unsure. Why? Curtin replied, because that would be a pleasure to end all pleasures. Area, shallow grave, less than a half mile from her car. For a candlelight vigil late last night to mourn happened. the teenager's tragic death. Now she's safe with the angels. You know, was a really set up for something. One of the neighbors took uh, the pot index number of the car. Uh, so uh, I'm going to see the six. found the body yesterday morning. Uh, to people and strike them without any warning whatsoever. And then the. 11.30 uh, Pacific time. The and ball was raped, brutally attacked. I guess you could say that Germany in the early 1900s were its golden age. Pre-depression, pre-Hitler, and with an above average economy, I guess everything would go into plan. And I guess you could also say, Peter Curtin weren't your average kid when a neighbor caught the 11 year old boy having sex with his pig stabbing the poor creature in the neck with scissors while he mounted him. Now for anybody, that should have raised a red flag. But I guess a country that eats boiled meat is a little more forgiven. By all accounts, Curtin had a rough childhood and was often forced to watch his parents have sex. And as he reached his teens, he ran out of jail as much as he was pig's asses. Petty thefts, robbery, arson, and he was a regular frequenter of brothels and street prostitutes. And it's believed that when he exited prison in 1913, he entered the big leagues and committed his first murder. By his own admission, Curtin had entered the tavern with the sole purpose of robbery and went upstairs where the owners lived. But when he entered one of the rooms, he encountered nine-year-old Christine Klein, who was sleeping. And perhaps, it was from being locked up for six years, but by his own admission, he lost control and strangled the child, then cut her throat and drank the blood from the wound. And the sound of the dripping blood on the floor made him jizz his pants. German jizz. He would later state that it was a sexual rush compared to no other. And by his own account, he went to the tavern across the street the next day. And as he listened to the men, tell the story of the gruesome rape and murder of the child. He chased himself again, reliving his horrific act. Mr. Sticky Pants went my lyrically wax. Curtin later admitted to the police that months after he went back to the girl's grave and he fondled the soil and he chased again. Mr. Jizzy Pants. The papers told the German citizens not to worry because it was most likely a crime committed by the communists who had gone back to Russia. I fucking hate commies. Two months after popping his cherry, Curtin committed the exact same murder. This time, entering home and killing a 17-year-old girl while she slept. And he told the court that he had an orgasm as he watched the blood dripping from her mouth. By the kinky Kraut's own admission, he intended to continue his murderous and perverted spree, but was caught breaking into a home and received eight years in prison for burglary and arson. Upon his release from his fourth incarceration in April of 1921, Mr. Jizzy Pants hit the streets, a man with a mission. It was then that he met and got engaged to former prostitute Augusta Schaff. By all accounts, 
It were a match made in heaven. Yeah, she were a real looker, but she'd also done time in jail for attempting to kill her ex-husband. But all marriages aren't perfect, and they got their peaks and valleys. And when Augusta found out the curtain was having an affair with two of their maids, I guess the relationship hit a valley, because she bribed one of the maids to press charges against Curtin. Ouch! Sending him back to the big house for a six months stretch. But you can't keep a committed man down. And upon his release, he got back together with his wife, and Mr. Sticky Pants were at it again. And in only one week, he broke into two houses, killing two men, cutting their throats, drinking their blood, and sodomizing them. I don't think it was these two clowns, although they are wearing suspenders. It was in August of 1929 that his killing spree reached an all-time high, murdering six women, three of them young girls, all with the same M.O. Police noted that the chosen weapon of the killer was a pair of scissors, which would cut their throats and often stab and mutilate them, cutting off their breasts, sis, and drinking their blood. Now all Germany were in terror. What the papers were now calling the Dusseldorf Vampire, a creature who would come in windows at night, slit their throats, then drink their blood, and no one was safe, even dudes. But in September and October of that same year, Mr. Sticky Slacks were getting sloppy because in four separate attacks to murder young women, they got away and they ID'd him. And now everybody knew the Dusseldorf vampire wasn't no vampire. He was just a freak of nature. And as the net were closing in on the cockhold killer, he murdered six more young girls, drinking their blood. It was then that he confessed it to his beloved wife that he'd killed over 50 men, women, and children, and told her the end was near, so she should turn him in to collect the reward money, so she wouldn't suffer in his absence. And his ever-dutiful ex-whore wife did just that, and she bought him a date with the guillotine. And the Dusseldorf's vampire's head is still on display at your local freak show. It was on an unusually mild day at a ski resort in Calzona, Italy, that an aircraft belonging to the United States Marine Corps was out on a low altitude training mission. The aircraft, flying at 560 miles an hour, was required by military regulations to fly no lower than 3,000 feet. On a low-level run through the valley, it severed a gondola cable that was at 360 feet. Where 20 passengers fell 280 feet to their death. There were no survivors. And why would that be? A holiday that turned out an unscheduled visit to the abyss. <sighs> and with a lot of people in Italy, already questioning America's purpose of being there. The U.S. had some splaining to do. Mi chiamo Tim Peppi, sono il comandante del 31esimo Stormo Casa Bombardieri e del 31esimo Stormo di Spedizione. In an earlier day, uh, the U.S. Marine Corps, the EA-6B aircraft, temporarily assigned to uh, Aviano Air Base, struck an object believed to be a gondola cable at approximately uh, 3.15 today. While well, the head of the U.S. base was assuring the country and the world that they were investigating this most serious of matters, it was at this time that the pilot, his navigator, and two joy riders were deleting all information of the accident, including videotape footage from the plane. And remarkably, the jet that was now considered part of a crime scene, wasn't even put under guard. The Italian government were furious about how the whole case was handled and were shocked that the Marines were able to just move around without being locked up. They wanted to try them on Italian soil, 
but because of a NATO agreement they had to do it back in the States, so they moved the trial to North Carolina. But the problem is, with 20 dead and three of those children, even the most pious country in the world wants a little payback. I'm here representing the United States of America uh, on this day of mourning uh, from this tragic accident uh, to express the people of the United States' sympathy and deepest condolences uh, to the families uh, who are here today to receive those condolences from this town and from this nation and to include the United States. situation, they're going to continue to work together as a team, uh, like they have been since the incident. They are working together at Aviano as well as here, as you know. Um, the lawyers uh, were together all day yesterday as they work out um, the cooperative agreement and they continue to investigate this issue. In terms of the agreement, who has jurisdiction over those pilots? In terms of agreement, in terms of the status of forces agreement, the U.S. military has jurisdiction. The crew nicknamed by the Italian press as a few not-so-good men were now on trial for manslaughter and were facing up to 200 years each in a North Carolina military court. But a conviction wouldn't be easy because the group of men were tighter than the Velcro straps on a retard's shoes. And with the exception of Captain Seagraves who just transferred in, they'd all served together since they were in boot camp. So if there were a code of silence, then they were already signed up. So for prosecutors, there was going to be a case at Divide and Conquer. And Seagraves was their man. They were betting he won't willing to do hard time to protect a bunch of jawheads that he just met. All four Marines testified that they had been on a routine, low-level training mission. And that nothing was out of the ordinary. The pilot, Captain Richard Ashby, testified that he believed his altitude instrumentation had been faulty and that he was unaware that he'd been flying so low. He believed that he'd been at a thousand feet, which is still a thousand feet below where he should have been flying. Forensics testified that the cable that was struck by the plane was at 325 feet, well below the 2,000 feet limit. All the crew had admitted under oath they knew they had hit the cable and had looked back and seen the cable car fall, but it had not radioed back to base. It was then that prosecutors put forward a memo from Marine High Command warning air crews against taking part in Top Gun show-off antics, and the memo specifically mentioned flying under the ski resort's cables, that they had been aware were taking place on a regular basis. But the captain and his passengers objected, saying they weren't doing nothing fancy. It was all strictly by the book. The plane's navigator, Captain Joe Schweitzer, also testified that the cables were not on the map that they were given. When it seemed the case was going nowhere, prosecutors decided to cut newbie Seagraves a deal. They could have nothing agreement that offered him complete immunity if he turned rat. I guess if you'd already spent your life living with the name Chandler, being known as a rat, wasn't much of a big deal. But once on the stand, he started singing like a retard on Christmas day with a karaoke machine. And he told the whole story, the regular Back to the Future parts one, two, and three. He said that the four chumps had been out joyriding and that Captain Ashby was flying as close as the ground as they all thought were possible. And he had a video camera and he was filming the whole thing from the back seat. And when prosecutors asked Chandler what were on that tape, he said Captain Ashby smiling and laughing like a spastic eating smarties as he wove in and out of those mountains. And when they got back to base, and he asked the captain what he should do with the tape, the captain answered, a smart man would destroy it. So that night, while they were all out at a bar, probably singing you've lost that love and feeling, he threw it on the fireplace. In the end, it was the pilot, Captain Ashby, and his navigator, Schweitzer, who were court-martialed for obstructing justice and conduct unbecoming of an officer and a gentleman. I love that movie because they destroyed the videotape evidence that only came to light after Seagraves ratted out on their asses. 
so they got six months in jail and then booted out of the Marines with no benefits. The other two clowns got off scot-free and continued their careers. The American government figured that each life were worth only $65,000, and that's what they paid the family. Which just goes to show, there's justice, and then there's government justice. In this life, we are presented with many different portals, doorways, if you will, and all we have to do is open them and step inside. But sometimes when you step in, you are not given the option to step out. Enter one Sanji Elba. By all accounts, the 41-year-old Alba's life were unextraordinary. Unemployed, one conviction for shoplifting, and suffered from long bouts of depression. He'd been caught on security cameras walking the Kyoto Prefect for two days, wearing the same clothing. Nice. It was on that third day that he was spotted on camera pushing a trolley with an unknown liquid in the vicinity of Kyoto Animation Studio. What that liquid was is still unknown. But with that liquid, he walked into the front door of the animation studios, poured it on the floor, pulled a lighter from his pocket, and released hellfire as he moved from room to room with his liquid death, incinerating the 70 people in the building, screaming repeatedly, die. The smoke detectors went off. The first place everybody went were the staircase, where their fire marshal instructed them to go. But he was waiting for them. The executioner bringing judgment day on the innocents. After the attack in Kyoto has risen to the the attack that had lasted just under five minutes, with many of the deaths on the staircase trying to reach the roof for safety. Witnesses reported seeing a man running, leaving bloodied footprints, being chased. And when they caught him, he screamed, You stole from me. Now I stole from you. Your souls. Just like that. Measy peasy. Japanesey. And many of those souls that he stole were women. Twenty of them in total. And the animation company that had brought so many happiness would now forever be associated with tragedy. And while Sanji Elba lays in a burn unit in critical condition, investigators have yet to ascertain whether he himself is an animator, much less had his work stolen. But I guess one may lyrically wax, there is no smoke without fire. Forever!